this morning with a Bible verse. It's one that's fairly mm -hmm. simple. Uh, Proverbs 10.22, it says, The blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds for sorrow to it. What you get from the scripture is God's blessing is something that enriches your life. And as it turns out, some of the things that enrich our life are things we often don't think about. I actually learned this from founding father Benjamin Rush. Uh, John Adams said of all the founding fathers, the three most notable were George Washington, Benjamin Franklin and Benjamin Rush. Now, if we don't know this guy today, we should. He is a very significant founding father. At Wall Builders, we own about 160,000 original items from American history. So we have thousands of handwritten documents of Washington, Adams, Franklin, Jefferson, and Benjamin Rush. I've got his prayer journals. I've got his so many handwritten documents related to faith. And interestingly, in reading his documents, he was trying as a good Christian. By the way, he started the first abolitionist society in America. Started the first Bible Society in America. He started the Sunday School Movement in America. He's the guy who lived out his Christian faith very publicly. And he writes uh, about, and he was just in his journals trying to be a good Christian, just trying to thank God for all the blessings he's enjoyed. And so he goes through and thanks God for blessing after blessing after blessing. And then he got into an area that really kind of made me scratch my head. One of the things he said, he said, I thank God for all the times I have not fallen downstairs. <laughs> That's a little bit interesting. <laughs> and I started thinking about it. I, you know, how many times I speak a lot, and I go up on, on the stage, and, and I go upstairs and don't fall, and nobody notices that. Now, if they noticed it, it'd be because I fell, and that's yeah. not a blessing. Yeah. It's like you go out to the grocery store, you drive your car, you don't have a wreck, nobody thinks about it. You got a home, you didn't have it. If you had a wreck, that would not be the blessing. And so a lot of, a lot of the things that we have as our greatest blessings are things that we just are used to, and we accept, and they're just, we don't think about it. It's like your health until something happens, or your family until something happens, your job until something happens. And, and some of the greatest blessings we have in America, we just take for granted. One of them is stability. Uh, if you look at where we are as a people, there's 193 nations in the world today at the UN. Out of those 193 nations, all of them have a, a form of government. And it's interesting that when you look at ours, we did ours in 1789, it's when the Constitution went into effect. Um, if you look at all the other nations, just since the time that we've had our, our one constitution, it's pretty interesting to see how often nations change. Now, we don't really think about this, we don't realize it, because we're not in those countries, we're just in America, and we don't ever change. I mean, we're just kind of the same, and we kind of take that for granted. But can you imagine living in any other nation of the world, whether it's a friend or whether it's an enemy, look how often those nations change governments. And so a question to ask is, okay, and the course of history, what's the average length of a constitution in the 5,800 years of recorded history? The answer is 17 years. Okay. Last September the 17th, when we had Constitution Day, we just celebrated 234 years on the same piece of paper. And say, what if we were like every other nation? What if we had a new constitution every 17 years? We don't think about that. We're just so used to having 234, 235, 236, whatever it is, that we don't think about how blessed we are in so many areas. And it's not just even our stability. It, when you look at things like creativity, now America represents 4% of the world's population. So when you look at creativity, we're expected to produce 4% of the world's creativity. That's not the case. It doesn't matter whether it's science technology, space technology, entertainment technology. It doesn't matter whether it's medical cure. It doesn't matter what it is. Our 4%, when you measure by copyright and patent protections, the actual literal measurements, our 4% of the world's population has produced more creativity and more inventions than the other 96% of the world combined. Now again, 4% should produce 4%, not us. We're so blessed with our creativity that we take it for granted. Now, I've got two kids active duty army right now, and I do a lot of speaking for the military, all branches, and, and so I travel a lot doing military stuff. And so they asked me to go do some training in military bases in Germany. We got 27 or 28 bases over there. So I went to Germany to do, do training there. Now, I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a cowboy from Texas. And I've got the ranch and the horses and the cows and everything that goes with it. And so while I was in Germany, it was really neat because cowboy life is pretty simple life. And I like it that way. But when I was in Germany, they put me in a five-star German hotel. And that was really cool because that's the old world elegance and castles. And, and the, I mean, the level of service in those five-star hotels, I was walking in the door. And it didn't matter who the staff was, they would call me by name, Mr. Barton, can we get something? It was just it was an amazing experience. And it would have been a whole lot more amazing experience if they would have had internet at that hotel. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll point out every Motel 6 in America has got internet. They had a five star there. That the, see, we just take for granted what we have, we don't recognize. And the same with our, even our prosperity. 
of where 4% of the world's population, but every year we produce between 24 and 25% of the world's gross domestic product. Now, according to census figures from last year, we did a census every 10 years. If you live below the poverty level in America, according to Census Bureau figures, your lifestyle is higher than the middle class in Europe. Now, that's pretty amazing, but we know from states like Hawaii, states like Mississippi, they specifically say that unless you're making more than $61,000 a year, you should not come off welfare because that's the benefit you get on welfare, $61,000. Now, the World Bank says the global standard of poverty, and the World Bank says $2 a day is the poverty level. That's 730 a year. So for the rest of the world, it's 730 a year, and we're talking $61,000. Really? So we just don't realize how different we are, but a lot of people do. That's why everybody else in the world knows how different we are. That's why everybody in the world wants to come to America and live in poverty. If they can just be in poverty in America, they've raised their lifestyle. And so that's something that we just don't understand, but other nations do. Back in 1831, a guy named Alexei Tocqueville came to America, looked at us, and said, this is really quite different. He wrote the book, Democracy in America, and he's the guy who came out with the phrase, American exceptional. He said the condition of the Americans is quite exceptional, and it may be believed that no democratic people will ever be placed in a similar situation. So even back then, we were already something special. Now, a good question to ask is why are we exceptional? What makes us different? And when you look at that, there's a good, good say, way to measure as well. Who are our leaders? Who's the one who gave us the documents? Who are the ones who came up with the ideas that we use? And the leaders would say, well, that's got to be people like George Washington and, and John Hancock and, and John Adam. And yes, that's right. Those are all really important leaders. But it's interesting to me that in 1816, John Adams received a letter from a young man named Hezekiah Niles. Now, Hezekiah Niles would have been like a millennial in that generation. He was not there when the American War for Independence occurred. But in 1816, he wrote Adams and said, I'm writing a book on the history of America. He said, you were there. You got format. You were a key participant in what happened. I wasn't there. We enjoy what we have today. But as an eyewitness, would you tell me, who do you think is most responsible for the ideas that have shaped America and created America? Who's, who's responsible for what we enjoy today? And Adam said, well, if you're asking me who's most significant in shaping the ideas that made America, he said, right up top, I put the Reverend Dr. Samuel Cooper, and of course, there's the Reverend Dr. John Jamaica, who don't forget George Whitfield, and, and, and you've got the Reverend Dr. Charles Chauncey. He starts going through a list of preachers. Now, today, we probably know who Whitfield is, but the chances that we know anything about Cooper or maybe or Chauncey is slim to none. And yet, the guys who actually wrote the nation pointed folks like that. Now, we don't point to Pastor Bay whether they're white or whether they're black. And who in the world is Richard Allen or Absalom Jones or John Moran or Lindell Haynes or Harry Hoosier, any of these guys, we don't have a clue, but let me just take Harry Hoosier for a minute, because this is a fun guy. He was in the Great Awakenings, and the Great Awakenings back then, you think of, well, that's George Whitfield and John Wesley and, and Charles Wesley, and, and you got Francis Asbury, you got all these famous guys in the Great Awakenings. And they all drew massive crowds. I mean, you're talking pastures of people, tens of thousands of people there gathered to, to hear their sermons. And yet, Francis Asbury, who rode 300,000 miles on horseback, and as a cowboy, I can tell you, that's a pretty good feat, 300,000 miles. That's like riding around the world 12 times on horseback. So he traveled that far in preaching. So 300,000 miles on horseback, massive crowds, and Francis Asbury said, well, Harry draws larger crowds than I do. Really? Harry's got bigger crowds than you do? And then Benjamin Rush attended his meetings, and Benjamin Rush said, Harry's the greatest orator I've ever heard. Oh my, you've heard Patrick Henry, you're running around all those famous guys. No, 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 nobody's as good as, as Harry. Now, significant, Harry's ministry was particularly among blue-collar Americans, guys that we would call kind of rough-and-tumble guys, the, the frontiers guys, the pioneer, the woodsmen, the, the trappers, the hunters, those kind of folks. And, and as they would get converted, their lifestyle would change. They didn't cuss quite so much, and they didn't drink so much, and they didn't fight so much. And what happened was Harry's ministry was along the East Coast. And so Harry's over in, in Delaware and Philadelphia and Jersey, et cetera, but his people got converted. And as America started moving west, you know, by 1803, we're out in the Ohio Territory. And we keep moving west. By the time you get to 1806, 1807, we're still moving west. And so all these trapper guys that have gone west, all these frontiersmen have gone west with it. And when they get out in 1806, 1807, they're all out further west. And it's interesting because a bunch of the other trappers said, man, these, these converts, they're, they're really different from the rest of us. Said, so what's the deal with them? And the answer was, uh, they're a bunch of those Hoosiers. 
Now, interestingly, you might associate Hoosiers with the Indiana Territory, and the Indiana Territory, I wonder how many people who live in Indiana know that they're named after a black evangelist. Well, probably not a whole lot, no. And you would think that a guy who has a state name for him might appear in some history books somewhere. See, we don't even know our own history anymore today. And so that's why John Adams points to these preachers. And, and so why would he point to the preachers? Well, another good example, the Declaration of Independence. Historians have documented that every single right set forth in the Declaration of Independence was preached from the American pulpit prior to 1763. So here's a homework assignment for you. Go back and read the Declaration of Independence as a list of sermon topics that we've been hearing for 15 years before the revolution breaks out. See, that's strange for us today to think the Declaration is a list of sermon topics, but it literally it was. And we own, a, with those 160,000 items, we own thousands of these sermons from back in that day, thousands of sermons from back then. And Adam's talked about how that our pulpits have thundered, and we really can show that. I mean, when you look at the sermons that were preached back then, what you find is a high degree of what we would call biblical relevancy. Um, they believe that whatever's in the news, whatever's in the headlines, people are thinking about that. You need to know how the Word of God applies to everything that's right. going on. And so that's what they would do. So here, here's a sermon from 1755. It's preached by the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Mayhew. Now, this is one of the guys that John Adams specifically, specifically talked about. It's a sermon on earthquakes. Now, it's my belief that every Christian should read the Bible through from cover to cover once every year. I mean, that Jesus says in Matthew that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If we ate our spiritual meals as often, if we ate our physical meals as often as we ate our spiritual meals, most of us would be dead. Because we, you know, we don't eat spiritual meals all that often. We physical meals work pretty well. Right now, the national stats are that only 9% of Christians read the Bible on a daily basis. So only 9% of Christians are even getting a spiritual meal once a day, which is not very good for living. Nonetheless, these guys were into the Word of God, and so I thought about this and thought, okay, they had an earthquake in Boston in 1755. They don't have earthquakes there, but when they did, the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Mayhew, one of the guys pulled up back by Adams, said, all right, we've had an earthquake, what does the Bible say about earthquakes? And I thought about that and said, okay, I remember an earthquake under King Uzziah. Remember an earthquake in the book of Amos? Uh, the earthquake when Jesus died, earthquake when Jesus resurrected. You know, I, I bet you I could do a good 20, 30 minute sermon on earthquakes in the Bible. Well, good for me. That's a five week sermon on earthquakes in the Bible. I'm nowhere close to that. And I actually went back a couple weeks ago and just pulled up a, a list on, online of all the earthquakes in the Bible. Dozens, dozens. And I haven't even paid attention to it. Because we're not used to looking at the Bible in the practical way that they did. They looked at it in a very practical way, applied it that way. Uh, so we had sermons on natural disasters, whether it's a fire or a flood or whatever. We got all these old sermons. Here's a sermon on the cry of Sodom entered into. It's a sermon on homosexuality, LGBTQ sermon. Now it's interesting today that the Bible is not quiet on this issue at all. The Bible has tons of, of verses dealing with LGBTQ issues. And it's interesting that right now polling shows us, we do a lot of national polling work with George Barn a lot and other pollsters. And so we know that right now 77% of Christians, 77% of traditional value Americans self-censor rather than talk about this issue. Because they know that they talk about this, they're going to get brain speeded. They're going to get deplatformed. They're going to get attacked online, whatever it is. So we've gone silent on something the Bible is not silent about. And as a consequence right now, Two generations ago, 1.6% of the nation identified as LGBTQ. Right now, 30% of millennials identify as LGBTQ. It's been that much change in fact because nobody's talking about the issue. The Bible talks about it. It's in the news all the time, but man, no, I'll, I'll get beat up if I don't do that. So we have sermons like this. This is on comments. Or actually, you see at the bottom, two sermons occasioned by the late blazing star. There is so much science in the Bible, so much in astronomy. There were sermons on solar eclipses and lunar eclipses and discoveries of new planets. You may recall the Bible speaks specifically about constellations like Orion and Pleiades and others. So there's so much science in the Bible, so much on astronomy. Uh, here's a sermon on the infirmities and comforts of old age. Probably not a popular topic, but it's what everybody's got to deal with. Everybody grows old, everybody deals with folks who are growing old. So we had sermons on aging. Uh, here's a sermon on religion, patriotism, and the extensions of a good soldier. It's an employment sermon. We had a lot of military sermons. You may recall even John the Baptist, as he was baptizing, specifically had instructions for officers and for soldiers. So much in the Bible on the military. So we had military sermons. 
Um, this is a sermon on the relation of the medical profession to the ministry. It's a discourse, another word for sermon. This is 1854. Significantly, when you go back and think about God bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, when he got them out into the desert, they had been slaves for 400 years. Now, the problem with being slaves for 400 years, you think like a slave, you act like a slave, every response you've got is conditioned as a slave. And so he's got them out there to make them into a nation. They're not thinking right, they're not acting right, nothing about it's right. And he says, okay, nobody's chasing you anymore because I walked out the Egyptians to the Red Sea. I've got you here at the mountain. You're not, you don't know, have a clue where you're going because you're following pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. So I've got your full attention. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a code on how to live. And he gave 613 laws among them, 10 commandments we often talk about, but it's a code of 613 laws. He gave them everything they would need to be a nation. He gave them laws on economics, on criminal justice, on consanguinity. He gave them laws on morals. He gave them laws on immigration. He gave them laws on agriculture, everything you can think of, including health care laws. Now, those laws took that, that group of slaves to become the number one empire in the old world. That legal code took them to the top. And see, it was everything they needed to know to become a nation, which is why the Word of God does apply to everything that, that happens in any nation today. I mean, it's interesting, even with the immigration debates we have, and verses are often popped up in Congress and hearings, and most people use Leviticus uh, 1934 and have no clue what they're talking about. But if you go through the full immigration code in the Bible, it's very comprehensive, very thorough. I have a Jewish rabbi who just loves helping Christians understand how thorough the Bible is because we don't spend much time in that code that they do. And so looking at this, it's interesting. In 1961, a guy named Dr. S.I. McMillan points out that, and he, he wrote a book in 1961 called None of These Diseases. Now that's based on Exodus 15, 26, where God told the Israelites, he said, look, I'm giving you health code, and if you'll do everything I tell you, I'll put on you none of the diseases that I put on the Egyptians. So you'll have a different life if you'll follow my health codes. And so he used that verse as the title of his book. And this is 1961. He said, you know what? God came out with that health code back then. He said, all the advanced nations, the, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, all laughed at the Israelites and said, what a bunch of doofuses they are. Look at their health code. That is so backward. He said, but now, nearly 3,000 years later, he said, we can now put numerous medical studies to everything God said on the health code in the Bible. It turns out God was like way ahead of everybody on the health code. And that was 60, that was in 61 he did that. So we're talking, you know, literally 60 years ago, we've got so many more studies we can put to, but we had sermons all on health care. Uh, this is a sermon on the character and tendency to property tax by the Reverend George Flow. Property tax? Yeah. Yeah, the Bible talks about minimum wage. The Bible talks about capitation taxes, income taxes, progressive taxes. It talks about estate taxes, inheritance taxes, everything you can think about. Because that was part of the, the code, the 613 laws. It's an economic code as well. So we had sermons on economics. Uh, this is a sermon on the Fugitive Slave Bill. Out of the millions of laws passed by the Federal Congress, this is definitely one of the top three worst laws in history. This law was passed in 1650. I have a ton of sermons. And, excuse me, this law was passed in 1850. I have a ton of sermons from 1851 where the pastors took the pulpit and said, okay guys, this is the federal law Congress passed last year. Listen well. If you obey this federal law, you are disobeying God. You are required to disobey this federal law. It calls for widespread civil disobedience. Led to what, this is what led to the Underground Railroad, by the way, was the Fugitive Slave Law. This is the reaction to it when the pulpit said, we're not doing that. that that's absolutely wrong. Matter of fact, even if you think the Bible talks about slavery, the Bible says that if a slave escapes, you can't chase the slave down. You can't have a Fugitive Slave Law. So even if you think the Bible's pro-slavery, which the South did, even at that point, it still says you can't chase a slave down if he escapes. So in the North particularly, and Ohio was the hotbed for so much of the Underground Railroad. This, this is what was really key, and it was this sermon that led to what we call jury nullification. Because if someone was arrested and tried under the future of the slave law, juries would absolutely set that person free. He said, you can't be convicted of breaking a, a bad law. And then we're just not going to do that. And so this was a huge thing. So we had social policy. Uh, this is a sermon, election sermon. So election and governments and governing. Uh, this is a fun sermon here. This is a voice of warning to Christians on the ensuing election of President of the United States to this war. Now, this is a preacher saying, guys, we have a presidential election. This is the election of 1800. It's between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And he goes through and says, you got to vote for John Adams. He, he's the guy. 
He's the guy you got to vote for. All right? That's an endorsement sermon, sounds like. Well, hang on a second. Because this is overcoming evil with good, a sermon. This is for Thomas Jefferson. So this preacher says, no, no, Adams is not the guy you want. Jefferson's the guy you want. And Baptists lined up behind Jefferson, congregations lined up behind Adams. So they had this thing going back. But here, wait a minute. These guys are endorsing candidates from the pulpit? You can't do that. Well, you, we're told we can't do that today because of what's called the Johnson Amendment. Now, the, the, the stuff with Johnson Amendment, significantly, this, this thing right here uh, is no longer even on the books. I mean, it's on the books, but it's been suspended. The Justice Department is not enforcing it. And this is a thing that says, you know, if you're a church, you don't get the same right of free speech everybody else does. And by the way, you do understand that unions are nonprofits. Is a union political or not? How can they do that? They're nonprofit. We self-censor in a very serious way. We just we, we wrap ourselves up and say, well, oh, nonprofit can't talk about that. Yeah, you can legally. We have been working for 10 years with National Legal Group, Last Defending Freedom, the Pope Initiative Project. We started 10 years ago and we went out and found pastors and got pastors to stand in their pulpit and endorse candidates. And we filmed them doing that and then turned them into the IRS and said, hey, you got to nail this guy because he endorsed from the pulpit. We did that because we wanted a suit in court because we knew we could win that suit. I've been involved in 13 cases in the U.S. Supreme Court, involved in a case this year at the Supreme Court. Knew we could win that case if we get it. And we've done, we've turned in more than 8,500 pastors for endorsing from the pulpit. Can't get the IRS to take the bait on any of them. Why? Because they know they will lose in court. And they would rather have 384,000 senior pastors and churches thinking you can't say anything than to have a court decision that says you can say anything. So it's really up here is our biggest opposition on this stuff. It's not the legal stuff because there's so much there. So the Johnson Amendment is not that big a deal. But as you see, there's relevancy to all these sermons. And that's why that that's why that John Adams, these are the guys he pointed to. Now, American Exceptionalism, I'm going to go a little deeper in this for just a minute because American Exceptionalism, where did it come from? Because we're our exceptional. That was a title that Alexia Tocco gave us. Where, where did this come from? It comes out of the Declaration of Independence. It comes from 46 words in the Declaration that has three principles. I want to show you these three principles because they pertain to where we are right now. And they pertain to what's happening with Janet, with the elections, with other things. Let me take you to those 46 words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Now. Those 46 words give three principles. Let me take you through those three principles real quickly. Uh, the first principle says all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator. What does that tell us? The first thing we're told in the Declaration, we acknowledge this is a divine creator. Now, it's interesting. In the court decisions over the last 40 years, the courts have changed that. Says, well, you know, you can do that in, in private, or you can do that as an individual or a group, but we can't do it publicly. That, that's not something the government can do. Government has to be neutral because we were told in, in cases, that, you know, we have a lot of atheists in America too, not just Christians, but atheists. And, and you know, we, we just can't take a position between the two. Time out. The first line of the Declaration says that this is the unanimous Declaration of the 13 United States of America. Now, we had atheists in America back then, and we're not telling anybody what you got to believe, but we are telling you that as a nation, we believe in God. As a, you can believe anything you want as a person, but as a nation, all 13 of our nations, and they were 13 nations back then, we became one nation with 13 states, but all 13 of our nations, we openly acknowledge and we tell the world, because this is the declaration of the world, that we believe in God. Now, that's significant because of, there's a couple of things that come out of that. That is the first step in limiting government. The founding Fathers gave us a limited government. Why would acknowledging God be a limit of government? Well, what happens when you acknowledge God, you acknowledge there's a power higher than government. Because you'll find the secular governments believe they are God. And this is part of what we see going right now, even with the secular House of Representatives. They're going to take over all the elections, federalize the elections, they're going to federalize all the economics. Every, you don't get your choices, we'll tell you what you need. But see, if you believe there's a God, then you believe in individuals, and you believe in individual rights, and you believe that there's a power higher than government, and government's not the highest power in our lives. 
you name any secular nation in the world, you take Morocco, you take Spain, you take Italy, you take France, you take Germany, you take Canada, you take anything you want to, and you'll find that that secular nation runs every aspect of your life. Um, and they will tell you if you can drive your trucks to Ottawa to protest. They will tell you that after you do, your credit cards don't work anymore because you've all been declared terrorists, and so now we shut your bank down, and that 85-year-old grandma that gave 25 bucks can't even get into her own bank account to, to get food or clothing or anything else because they shut her down for supporting terrorism. Well, it, was a, it wasn't terrorism when that thing started. It was terrorism when Trudeau said it was terrorism, not because any court ruled that. So we even saw in our closest neighbor, Canada, what happens when you have a secular government that just says, we'll tell you what your rights are and we'll define them for you. Well, that goes on all the time in Europe. We're pretty ignorant about what goes on in Europe most of the time. So that was their belief. Now, it's interesting. When you look at George Washington, on the day that we finished the Bill of Rights, is the day that he issued the first ever prayer proclamation in America. The day we finished the Bill of Rights, is that this is worth thanking God for. And so that day of Thanksgiving, when on the original of that, and Washington tells us why, that he issued this call for Americans to, to, to acknowledge God. And it's right here in the first. He says, it is the duty of, and by the way, notice the word duty. The definition of duty in their day was a legally binding contractual obligation. He says, it is the legally binding contractual obligation of all nations. He didn't say individuals. He says, the legally binding contractual obligation of all nations to do four things. Notice what he said nations or states are supposed to do. Number one, they're supposed to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God. Number two, obey His will. Number three, be grateful for His benefits. Number four, implore His protection and favor. And that is the duty of nations. There was nothing secular in their thinking about we have to be neutral on religion. Now, we tell you right up front, there is a God, and it's because of that that we have rights, and that's why we have liberties, etc. So there's nothing secular in the way it went at, and that's what they told the world. This is a declaration to the world on why we're separated. So that's the first aspect of living together. The next phrase you'll find is they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, this is a declaration that we believe that there are certain rights that come from God. They don't come from government, they come from higher than government, they come from God. And this actually is a second step in limiting government. Now, how does that acknowledgement limit government? Go to my ranch for a bit. On my ranch, I've got a red pickup, and I like my red pickup, and I think everybody should have a red pickup. <laughs> my son Tim, however, is of a different mindset. He has a black pickup. I think you should have a red pickup. So when he drove that pickup on the ranch, I promptly spray painted it red. Because everybody needs a red pickup. Actually, I didn't spray paint it red. How come? Because it doesn't belong to me. Anything that belongs to me, I have the right to spray paint red. I can spray paint the cows red. I can spray paint the roads red. I can spray paint the pastures red. I can spray paint. I can spray paint red anything that belongs to me. What happens here is government says, uh, wait a minute. These are rights, government, that you can't spray paint red. These rights did not come from you, they don't belong to you, and you can't touch them. And so this is the second step of limited government is acknowledge that there are certain jurisdictions. Government is not supposed to get into everything. There are things that come from God that government cannot touch. Government can touch what belongs to government, but not everything belongs to government. And that's what we made clear right here. So that was the second step. Now, what's an enable right? This is the word that we throw around a lot. We don't have a very good definition. Let me show you the founders' definitions for this. Let me go, for example, to John Dickinson. He not only helped with the Declaration, he became a signer of the Constitution, strong Christian man. John Dickinson said, an enable right is a right which God gave to you and which no inferior power has a right to take away. So it's a God-given right, government, and nobody else can touch that right. You have the same thing from Alexander Hamilton. He said an enable right, he says, they're not to be promised for among old parchments or musty records. They're written as with a sunbeam, and the whole volume of human nature by the hand of divinity itself and can never be erased or obscured by any mortal power. These are rights that come from God to you, and no human power can interfere with those rights. You have John Adams says the same thing. He says, the able rights are antecedent for all earthly governments. they are rights that cannot be repealed or restrained by human laws. they are rights derived from the great legislator of the universe. So these are God-given rights, and government can't touch any right that's God given. Now, they went through and identified about two dozen what they call inalienable rights. These are rights that government is never allowed to put their greasy little fingers on because these came from God, not from government. Now, most of the state can't identify most of those rights. There's the right of expatriation, the others. 
The Bill of Rights has about 16, 17 of those rights. They listed four, the Declaration of Independence. So they, they went through and identified about two dozen of those rights. And so never get what are they? What are our rights? Well, Sam Adams, the father of the American Revolution, right up front, he said, we told you in the Declaration that there's first the right to life, secondly, liberty, thirdly, the property, together with the right to defend them. There's four right there. Life, liberty, property, and the right to defend them, right of self-defense. So he said, we told you that in the Declaration. That, that's really clear. And then after the Declaration, 11 years later, we said, well, remember we told you in the Declaration 11 years ago that there were in that four naval rights, and we said, among others, here's some of the others. So in the First Amendment, there's five more. In the Second Amendment, there's two more. In the Third Amendment, there's one more. You just go through the amendments, and you come up with 16, 17 other inalienable rights. So you throw that with the Declaration, that's where you get around 2021, and then they write about things like the right of expatriation is an able right, things that we just, again, are talking about. And by the way, if you don't know what the right of expatriation is, it means the right to move freely among all the states. A deer can jump the fences and go into other pastures if you want to. A deer can move all over. It doesn't matter where your lines are. They can jump that. And so I can go from here to California or from here to wherever. Except California says, oh, no, there's 17 new states that think marriage is between a man and a woman, and there's only two genders. So nobody from California that works for the government can go to your state. That violates the right of expatriation. That was what the founders talked about. You have the right to move freely among your states. And yet the woke states are saying, you guys that aren't woke, we're not going to let anybody go to you that works on our government. No, you can't do that. We have the enable right of expatriation. Or not of ex, ex, well, we call it that, but the right to move between the states. So this is enable rights. Now, the third thing they say in the Declaration of those 46 words is that to secure these rights, government is instituted among men. Uh, we now know the primary purpose of government. It's not to secure the borders, and it's not to make sure everybody's got a job, it's to make, not to make sure the economy's right. The first responsibility of government is to make sure you have enable rights that cannot be touched by government. First thing we do is put those rights out of bounds and draw a fence around them and say, government, you can't touch them. Now, interestingly, there's a lot of founders who talk about this. James Wilson, he is one of only six founders who signed the Declaration and the Constitution. He's the second most active member in writing the Constitution. And George Washington put him on the original Supreme Court as an original justice. He started the first law school in America. We actually have his original law books in that law school. He said he owned the Supreme Court in 1791, also teaching law school at the Supreme Court. So a pretty interesting arrangement. And so in that, this is what he tells his students. He says, now we had an American Revolution some 15 years ago, and here's why we had it. He said, the principal object of our government was to acquire a new security for the possession of those rights which we were previously entitled to the immediate gift of our all wise and all beneficent creator. He said the reason we had to create a new government was we were previously entitled to these rights, but Great Britain started violating them. We had a Bill of Rights, we had a Magna Carta, and Great Britain started violating them. King George especially did. And so we had to create a new government to acquire security for the possession of those rights that we were supposed to have already. The reason we did the American government is we no longer had protection for inalienable rights. We used to as British citizens, then the government got involved and regulated our rights. Now we start a new government where that won't happen anymore. So that was the purpose of government. You have the same thing with Sam Adams. He says, government was originally designed for the preservation of inalienable rights. And by the way, I take you back to Genesis 9 and show you that. The first civil government in the world was Genesis 9. God gave what are called the Noahide laws. He gave seven laws to Noah. You don't murder, you don't steal, et cetera. That's the first civil government. And they were all designed for the protection of animal rights. Well, why did God say in Genesis 9 that whoever sheds man's blood, by man will his blood be shed? Capital punishment, in other words. Because he was protecting the animal right to life. You see, we had murder going on. And murder's not supposed to go on because God's given you a right to life. So if you're going to violate someone else's right to life, then we're going to punish you for doing it. So the very first law in the Noah had laws was to protect the animal right to life. And so even at the very beginning, God was trying to protect enable rights because he intended that way. And then you see Cain and Abel and the whole world gets so derailed. He says, okay, let's just wipe them all out and start again. Now we're going to start again. And here's the laws you're going to live by this time. You're not going to kill each other. You're not going to steal from each other. They're all about protecting enable rights. That's what the Noahide laws do. So you go here, all right. So the preservation of the enable rights, what were those? Remember what he said back in the Declaration? He says, first, there's a right to life, secondly, liberty, thirdly, property. Now, this is the fun one. 
the right to life. We thought, wouldn't it be cool that the founding fathers had been talking about abortion in the way that we did? Because then we'd be going to court, we can argue original intent right to the Supreme Court, say, hey, these guys were talking about abortion, but obviously that's not what they were talking about, but it would be cool if they had it. What's the obviously that's not what they were talking about? Which is what people assume today. Talk to a bunch of congressmen and say, yeah, that wasn't what they were talking about with the right to life. Really? Then why did they do books like this from 1808 on abortion in America? Why did 1779, why did Thomas Jefferson ban abortions in the legal code of Virginia when he wrote that in 1779? Why did the other founding fathers talk about abortions and ban abortions if this wasn't about the right to life, unborn life? Well, it's interesting because when you read this, you find them talking specifically about that. Um, this right to life means literally what it says it means is the right to life. James Wilson go back to his law books. In his law books where he's teaching these students, he says, students, he says with consistency, beautiful and undeviating, human life from its commitment to its close is protected by the common law, Seventh Amendment of the Constitution. He says that in the contemplations of law, life begins when the infant is first able to stir in the womb and by the law that life is protected. Now time out here. He said, as soon as you know there's life on the inside, at that point, the law kicks in and it's protected. As soon as you know. How long did it take him to know back then? First trimester. But as soon as you know there's life in there, that's when the law kicks in to protect. This is where technology changes. This issue doesn't change, technology changes. How long does it take today to know there's life on the inside? Eight days after fertilization, we know. Or heartbeat. Once you can de detect a heartbeat, you know there's life. Then at whatever point you detect life, at that point, the law kicks in to protect life in the womb as soon as you know there's life there. See, this goes back to the founding fathers being pro-life at the very beginning, and they wrote about it. As a matter of fact, John Witherspoon signed of the Declaration of President Princeton. He has a lecture that he gave at Princeton on why America is different from Europe. He said, in Europe, they allow parents to abort their children. He said, we don't do that over here. He says, we know that life comes from God. He said, in secular Europe, they think that life comes from the parents. Life doesn't come from the parents. It comes from God. And so in explaining that to the students at, at Princeton, he says, a perfect right in a state of natural liberty is the right to life. He says, here in America, we did not have the power of life and death of parents. We don't let abortions happen. Now, it wasn't the, the, the physical DC kind of abortions. It was chemical abortions they used back then. But as long as people have been pregnant, there are people who do not want to be pregnant. Abortion is nothing new. It's only the technology that's changed. We've always had abortions. You can find them in every era, and there's certain chemicals and certain potions and certain whatever. And so even as you read about abortion here in America, it wasn't the physical kind that we do. It was taking things that would kill the child on the inside, which is still an abortion. It's still killing the child on the inside. So the technology changes, but the issue is not new. There's nothing new under the sun, the scripture tells us. And literally, there isn't. So the right to life, and it's interesting, notice the word first. Now, that's an interesting word, that that's the first right they started with. And it's interesting for several reasons. Because if you can figure out where someone is on the life now, oh, I don't know who's running for U.S. Senate in Montana. I don't, I don't care who's running for Senate. If you will tell me where they are on the life issue, with a 98% degree of certainty, I will tell you how they will lower every other issue they face. You tell me where they are in life, I'll tell you what they do on the, the small arms treaty. I'll tell you what they do on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. I'll tell you where they are on climate change. I'll tell you where they are on taxes. I'll tell you where they are. You just tell me where they are in life. And with a 90% degree of certainty, I will tell you exactly how they're going to vote on every other issue. Now, it's interesting. If you're wrong on the life issue, you're also going to be wrong on the First Amendment guarantee for the prayer exercise of religion. Oh, we need to regulate that. We don't need God. If you're wrong on life, you're going to be wrong on other inalienable rights. If you get the first inalienable right wrong, you're going to get the second, third, fourth, twentieth inalienable right wrong. If you're wrong on the right to life, you're going to be wrong on the Second Amendment right to defend myself. You're going to say, oh, guns are really bad. We've got to regulate the guns. How about regulate the heart? No, no, that's really good. We don't do that. Oh. No, it's the heart. It's, you know what would have saved Abel from Cain, if we had rock control laws, we could have saved Abel from Cain. <laughs> what we need is he clubbed him to death with a rock. If we just had rock control laws, we wouldn't have murder. No, if you got murder in your heart, it's going to come out some way. So if you're wrong on the right to life, you're going to be wrong on self defense. 
If you're wrong on the right to life, you're going to be wrong on the Fifth Amendment private property. If you're wrong on the right to life, you're going to be wrong on the Seventh Amendment definition of marriage. Yeah. You'll get everything else wrong if you're wrong on the life issue. Now, granted, those are all social issues we're talking about. And, and people say, well, I, I'm, a, I, I'm not a social conservative, I'm economic conservative. Okay, let's talk about economic issues for a minute. If you look at economic issues, there are a lot of groups out there that measure economic issues, and you know what they are. We're seeing a whole lot of them right now. I mean, the stuff that comes out of D.C., debt, taxes, debt, all those are economic issues. Well, if you take something, we're talking life, so let me take a, a life group like Susan B. Anthony. They will, every year, rank all the 435 members of the House of Representatives. And this year's ranking, if you look, these are all 100 percenters. These are all folks that are 100% pro-life. Everything's right on, on the way they go in life. They protect life every opportunity they get. Well, there's all the groups in D.C. that really don't care about life issues. Like, for example, if you take groups like um, the American Americans for Prosperity. These guys, all they care about is economic issues. It's interesting. If you want to see the best economic votes in, in America, it's actually one-to-one -one correlation. If you get life right, you'll get every other issue right. You'll be right on economics. Well, I'm only an economic conservative. No, you say you are. If you're wrong on life, you're probably only going to vote 40, 50, 60 percent. You can call yourself an economic conservative. You're not going to be. Voting records, what, what it says on that. And then on the other side, if you take the worst life represents, those that get a zero on the life issue, and if you bump them up against what happens with up, what happens with America for prosperity, you see almost the same one-to-one -one correlation. They're really bad on economics. They're really bad on life. They're really bad on everything else. And it makes a lot of sense because if they won't protect your life, why would they protect your money? You know, which is more important, your life or your money? Life. If they won't protect the most important, why would they protect what's, what's less? And so that's why it becomes so significant. And that's why a right to life is first. As social issues, economic issues, you know, if you're going down the interstate, once you're off the interstate, you're off the interstate. And you're going to be wrong until you get back on the interstate, and that's the life issue. If you can't get that one right, you're off track somewhere, and you're going to be off track on everything else that comes up, just all, all the way across the board. So what has to happen, you have to elect leaders, you don't have to lobby, and that's where life has to come first. Now, you got Janet running, and I think life is first for her. I don't, I don't wonder where she's going to be on economic issues. Well, there's so much more than Congress and life. You don't get the 10 or 12 votes a year on life issue. And there's nearly 1,000 votes a year that congressmen cast. Most of us aren't aware of how many votes they cast. So somewhere between 13 and 15,000 bills introduced to federal Congress every year. We have a legislative network. We have about 1,000 state legislators we work with, including a bunch of guys here in Ohio. Last year, in the last 12 months, we've had 159,000 pieces of legislation introduced at the state level. 159,000 pieces. It's, it's 13 to 15,000 at the federal level, and there's about 1,000 votes a year cast at the federal level. Try to name 1,000 votes in this room. We might come up with a dozen, maybe. So there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on that we never even see about, and a whole bunch of economic issues. She's only going to get to vote on 10 or 12 life issues. It doesn't matter. I know how she's going to vote on the rest of the issues, because if you get life first, everything else is going to go in, in, in that right direction, because that's the viewpoint. So again, the, the axiom that you want to elect leaders, you don't have to lobby. I don't think you have to lobby Janet to do this right. It's going to be a fairly easy thing to, to do. So this is why Christians getting involved has such an impact. If we don't get the right kind of leaders in, we won't get the right kind of government. And it goes back to us Christians. It goes back to us as churches, us as, as people of faith getting actively involved in that arena. And as you've seen, this is the way it was. This, you know, going back to John Adams, who did list, it wasn't political guys, he listed the spiritual guys. Because that's what shaped the political world, and that's what we have to get back into today is to recover that part of our history. God bless you guys. Thanks for letting me share with you.